้นเลยเนาะเพราะว่าเราสี่สิบกว่าคนแล้วค่ะโอเค so uh, I think I'm the only <laughs> first batch here available <laughs> but anyway I I would like to welcome you to an hour second batch of leadership workshop for both um for stats and net and and we are having like fortunate to have you here to tell us a little bit about um the future of food foresight and Luke it, Luke Tay is a founder of um Concopia right future space right now you're entrepreneur futurist and also lecturer at the Gunyu Institute in Singapore and uh, he has many experience about food industries and also other two of foresight and I believe we will gain a lot from him today. So without further ado, I'll give the stage to Luke. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Suvaluk. It's my pleasure to uh, see you again and uh, to be invited to share my thoughts. Um, can you see my screen? Just uh, give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. So um, just a quick background um, about me. Uh, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a food scientist. You know, so um, don't let me give you scientific or nutritional advice. You might die. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm a social scientist. I'm a political scientist and a historian uh, in terms of my academic background. And I spent about 20 years in the Singapore Public Service doing um, corporate work because of my uh, background, non-technical background, first in aviation uh, and then in uh, agri-food. Uh, and now, as uh, Sue mentioned, um, I run my own consultancy and do a lot of teaching, focusing around two topics. Number one, how to think about the future, different strategic planning methods that I learned and used in the public sector. And number two, uh, talking about food systems, and the future of food systems. And like a Venn diagram, these two topics come together. So I'll be sharing with you a little bit more on this. I'll try not to talk so much or for so long uh, to leave uh, time for any uh, Q&A or discussion. So uh, Sue, so, uh, no pressure, but if my talk's really boring, I have to rely on you to at least ask one or two questions uh, before we close. <laughs> no worry. I'll... Okay. Okay, so uh, let's begin. Um, so anyway, um, so I think, um, you know, one, one thing I want you to, to ask yourselves is, uh, I know you are, uh, young, uh, emerging leaders. So maybe you aren't, the, uh, you haven't had 20, 30 years in, uh, food, you know, uh, and you haven't had time to form a very definite worldview and so on, but you've lived through a lot, uh, our generations over the past 10 20 years. Uh, I think uh, some folks entering the workforce now are too young to remember what I do. I was in college when 9-11 uh, happened. I'm going to talk a lot about politics, but uh, in its relation to food, you know, and th that was a big shock to the system. And then there was the Arab Spring in uh, the late uh, 2000s that was partly because of uh, food insecurity and uh, food price inflation. You know, so I think just keep in mind this question. How have you been surprised over the past uh, few years? Uh, I think besides the obvious COVID-19, you know. So why do we think about the future? We think about the future uh, in one way to not be so surprised if things happen that other people find surprising. And uh, similarly, what would you want to know uh, for your business success, your professional success about the future? So that's one practical reason to use different foresight techniques. Okay, excuse me, I'm just minimizing my screen. Okay, so um, I think we've known about climate change. Uh, it's been brewing, now it's boiling. Uh, but the key thing is that we thought that the world had a plan to deal with climate change. It's called the Paris Agreement to limit uh, emissions so that the temperature won't go more than 1.5 degrees Celsius above the baseline. But unfortunately, that's not been happening. Why hasn't it been happening? Partly because of politics, geopolitics around the world getting more messy. We had a pause because of COVID that led to a reset in some ways, including uh, industrial production. It also disrupted food security. And most recently, uh, I think all around the world, certainly in Asia, 
we've also been affected by a conflict that on the one hand seems on the other half, uh, on the other side of the world, but the effects are very much here at home as well. So where are we now as a world? Um, people have come up with this term, the poly crisis, not just one crisis, but many coming together in ways that we can only partly understand. And poly crisis has affected the food sector. But um, as people know, there's a Chinese proverb that talks about how when there's great crisis, there's also uh, a lot of opportunity. And the opportunity comes to those who can see what's happening first and position themselves to be resilient, to be entrepreneurial, to be innovative. And you can do so in a selfish way or you can do so in a humanitarian way that helps people in your country and around the world. And this certainly applies to the food sector. So what do I see on the horizon? Let me share with you a few themes and then talk about how we do that, how we see that. So there's a poly crisis, as I mentioned, but it's also in a way a poly opportunity, including to turn the food system around and transform it in ways we think are better. And some of the less obvious parts of the poly crisis to me are crisis of psychology, mental health, even imagination, uh, people feeling very tired and sad, not seeing a way forward. So in food, you guys and ladies as young leaders have to lead and find that way forward. Demographics. Many of us would have heard the saying that we need to feed 9 billion, 10 billion people by 2050. Is that true? Maybe not, you know, because I think there's a birth strike going on because of all the problems and because of fears of what the future will bring, many people are choosing not to have children. And the demography is aging, I think, in Thailand, definitely in Singapore, and places like Japan and China. We've talked about sustainability, but there's a lot of people who are very cynical, who think that some people who are selling sustainability are actually cheating, or they're actually wrong, that it's greenwashing, uh, certainly in different parts of agri-food. And some types of sustainability movements have also been linked to politically extreme movements, the type that don't like immigrants, for example. And I think one interesting uh, idea that will define your careers will be this concept of what technology can do. There is this ideology called eco-modernism that basically says, Let's invest more in technology. Let's double down on technology. And technology will advance in food, in energy, in water, and so on, so that humanity can have a good life and can move into cities and move away from the countryside so we can move into modern, future smart cities and let the rest of the land rewild and recover and regenerate. That's exciting if we can do that and that would be awesome. And obviously food will be one cornerstone of that. But on the other hand, there are people who say we need degrowth. The climate emergency is already here. Some of this tech won't happen. And some of this tech actually reinforces inequality. And what we need to do is to be very disciplined, to take a haircut like I did have a very simple economy that's just based on essentials for life and living and drastically reduce industrial activity and emissions. And similarly for the food sector as well, eat very simply, maybe get rid of animal agriculture because of its emissiveness. So it's an arm wrestle between these two paradigms. And is it to compromise between the two or can we find a synergy? I think that will be very important. Technology, we can talk about so much, and you would know more about some details of technology and food science. But to me, the way we've developed technology could be said to be quite wasteful. I'm not talking about Thailand, but I think in general, because I think there's so much research that's done, especially on the academic side and some labs that uh, uh, doesn't uh, go to the market. And so that's a lot of effort uh, that 
you haven't got the return on investment from. So just like we talk about a biocircular economy in actual food and byproducts, there should also be a circular economy of innovation. Uh, there are some innovations that are new ideas, but that we can recycle and valorize, including to realize more efficiency in a cost-effective way in the field, not just in very high-tech stuff that we do uh, in the middle of the city. Okay, so that's just a warm-up on the state of the world as I see it. And so how do we develop thoughts about the future? Let me introduce you to the concept of foresight. The idea of foresight is that you want to explore not just one theory of what's happening, one forecast, but a range of possible futures. And to look at what we don't know yet in a very deliberate way. And so again, it's not a forecast. It's not saying that, oh, Bangkok temperature will be 34 uh, tomorrow and it will be raining, but it's to talk about plural futures so that we can plan across different scenarios of what can happen. So we can be future ready, no matter what actually happens, including based on many factors that are beyond our control, at least to understand what these factors are. And so this is one good illustration of what I'm talking about. Any responsible professional or organization or even a government will have a strategic plan based on the blue circle, the projected future. But then we know stuff happens, you know? And so there's a plausible gray circle around it of a range of ways things could turn out a bit differently. And then reasonable people will also think about how if some unexpected, unlikely things happen, but they still know about these things, you know, then there's a possibility that will diverge a bit more. And then there's also our own hopes, dreams, and value judgments about where we want to be. I've talked about different visions of the food sector, for example. So that's the green circle. It could be a, a, a range of things that we actually want to happen that's different from what we think will happen. And then there's the widest red circle of things that maybe you would say you must be crazy to think about or talk about now. If you raise the idea at a meeting, maybe people will laugh at you. Um, I was talking to uh, people from meteorological departments, weather departments around the world yesterday. And I asked them for an example of what is just crazy to think about. And of course, meteorology is important for agronomics and for agriculture. So I suggested to them you know, that uh, you guys use all these scientific techniques. What if you use the witch doctor or a mystic or a monk to tell you what the, the weather will be, you know? But it happens uh, in uh, criminal justice. Some uh, detectives use psychics to try to get leads when they investigate crime. So I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, you know, but uh, it would probably go in the preposterous, the crazy side of things. So it's broadening our sense of how the future can develop. And then I'll talk to you in a while and give you an example at the end of uh, using scenarios to think through the uh, uh, specific trajectories across that cone of possibility. Then we come to the concept of the used future. What is this? Basically, it's a vision of what the future will be and should be that is past the sell-by date. Maybe the trends and factors that form the vision are no longer there. They are different. Let me give you one example. Industrialization. Previously, even until quite recently, the view was that to be developed and to have a good life, countries have to industrialize, build up a manufacturing sector, and it's a lot of fossil fuel-based development. But in the face of the climate crisis and banging into our planetary limits, I would suggest to you that this is a used future, no longer fit for purpose in terms of guiding where we should go or can go. Today, this is perhaps the dominant vision, one of green growth, saying that let's do well for ourselves and our planet by using solutions turning different areas of industry, production, and the economy into a sustainable way. 
definitely the agri-food sector is trying to do that, such as in Thailand with your BCG model and with things like agrivoltaics, renewable energy into agri-food. And also through different solutions, uh, for example, that aren't very high tech, but maybe agroforestry, you know, carbon farming um, and uh, reviving some native species. But then I think, again, my question to you is, can we really continue to develop and improve people's economic well-being while still being good for the planet? I think that the next 10 years, 15 years, will show whether we can or not. This is plan A, but maybe humanity will need a plan B, especially if the climate gets really bad. And in fact, if the world, the region goes into a failure mode, I think that's where nutritionists, food scientists will be needed more than ever, even for things like reformulation to make sure people, uh, infants, mothers, the vulnerable, normal working people uh, can get adequate nutrition in a time of great resource constraint, in a time when there's contamination, in a time when there's conflict over scarce and diminishing food resources. So it's a jungle out there. Uh, and uh, many people use animals to describe things that we want to know about the future. There's a black rhino, things that we know are important and we know are there, but for some reason, it's inconvenient, embarrassing to think about it, to talk about it, to deal with it. You know. Then we have uh, black elephants, the known unknowns, things that we know are important, but we don't know if or when they'll happen, or we don't know so much about it. And a lot of our focus would be on looking out for and dealing with these black elephants. Then there's the famous, the infamous black swan. These things are bad stuff that uh, people claim not to have been able to even imagine or understand that comes up and happens randomly. Um, on the political side, some people say 9-11, the World Trade Center attacks were a black swan. Is that true? Not really, because actually there was a lot of evidence there, but people didn't piece the pieces together. Similarly, when you have a food safety scandal, uh, is it really a black swan? It might be that um, there was just not enough communication, understanding, and uh, conveying information about the risk to come up with adequate control measures against it. And then there's also the uh, gray jellyfish. This one is interesting. It's an unknown known. So it's something that's always been there, but then that poses a new type of risk that we didn't understand before. So how do we look out for all these animals that are important, that are disruptive, and that cause crisis, but also opportunity? We do that through scanning the horizon. Horizon scanning is probably not new for you, Many of you, especially if you're in a regulatory role, will do risk surveillance, looking out for problems with, uh, for example, uh, contaminants in your domestic food supply, in your imported supply chain, or looking out for pests and diseases, for example. So, but this horizon scanning is broader. It's across the whole pestle of politics, economics, social factors, technological, environmental, legal, and regulatory. In other words, beyond what any one department or many professional organizations see as their job, but it is stuff that can shape the landscape in which their mission and vision will sink or swim. That's where we come up with the concept of emerging issues or emerging strategic issues. These are things that can pose a high impact if they happen in a big way, but currently, because they're not happening yet, at least not obviously, there is low awareness. And so one of the futurist jobs is to scan the horizon, identify these emerging issues, these new animals that are crawling onto the landscape, and then looking at sense-making. What is this? What is its significance? And then working with leadership, with planners and experts to have a conversation on so what? What do we do with this in order to make sure that our plans and our strategies are future ready? 
and also that we can innovate new solutions, be they technological, scientific, or policy, or operational, or a social innovation to address these issues. So one of them, just an example, is greenwashing, like I mentioned. So that's something my country is working on. Our plan A is to pursue green growth and new green solutions in green financing, in green agri-food technology and so on. But some of the investment and focus now is on building up the way to be able to trust, measure and trust the integrity, for instance, of carbon credits, or to be able to know the full carbon accounting of new forms of food production, like lab-grown meat, cultured meat, or indoor farming, which are very consumptive of electricity, for instance, that has a carbon impact, even as they save on water and on space. So how do we do this sense-making of these emerging issues? I'll quickly show you two examples uh, of uh, techniques that futurists use. One of them is futures wheels. Just think of this water analogy of the ripple effects of something happening that are wider than the first effect. <clears throat> so this is one uh, image of a change and you put that in the middle, that's the drop of water or that's maybe Chernobyl, uh, the nuclear reactor of Fukushima happening. And then so many things happen as first order consequences and most smart people, if they think about it, usually will be able to think of first order consequences, especially if they're within their organizational and professional remit. But then you think about one, how one thing leads to another and another, second, third order consequences as well. If we had more time, we could talk through examples. But I think one example for food is think about how with the Ukraine conflict, there was a big shock in terms of grain price and availability, and also NPK, price and availability. And I'm sure as food professionals, you can think of many, many second and third order consequences of that for the food system including for food prices. And here's an example that you'll get in the circulation slide of one thought experiment that I and some other people did on that. And then we have the futures triangles. This is what I call the physics of the future. When we're dealing with an important question, maybe let's just take, for example, the future of snack foods or where are snack foods heading? You know, So I put that topic in the middle of this triangle and then what do I think? I think about three things, the past, the present, and the future. First, I will think about the weight of history. What is this? This is all the legacy stuff that is relevant to thinking about where this issue will go in the future. It could be things like um, consumer tastes and preferences. It could be things like the burden of disease from um, non-communicable disease, from certain types of snacking or overnutrition. It could be things like um, industry interests that want things to stay the same way and not change in a way that could be better for overall human welfare. So that's the weight of history. Or the weight of history could be something good. Uh, as Thais or as Singaporeans, I'm sure you're proud of some aspects of your history and culture. And these things will steady you in the storms uh, to come in the future. You know, so the weight of history is not a good or bad thing, but it's a very big fact in thinking about any type of change in the future. Then we come to the push of the present. Basically, it's a question of what is happening now that makes it impossible for things to stay the same and we must move forward, we must change. So what would the push of the present be? Uh, if you're a snacking company, it could be rising competition, it could be uh, rising uh, upstream price pressures and you not wanting to pass that on to the consumer. It could be a range of things, the push of the present. It could be maybe that you fear that there'll be a carbon tax or a salt tax or a sugar tax trying to get your products to be more healthy or more sustainable. And then we come to the pull of the future. This would be you and all your other stakeholders, dreams, visions, hopes, wishes, ambitions 
for where you want the future to go, the future of snacking. And so that's the physics of the future. The three different vertices of the triangle will act as different forces acting together to move the future of snacking in this example forward. So the futures triangle is a good way to capture in one diagram, in one mental frame, all the relevant factors for the future of a certain issue, a certain phenomena. Okay, and then uh, lastly, uh, um, I'll just talk to you briefly about scenarios. Um, never mind the definition you see here. Scenarios are a method to think through what can happen over the medium to longer term future in an area that concerns you. For instance, you could say scenarios on the food security of Thailand in 10 years time. What, how food secure will Thailand be in 10 years time? That could be a question. And then you use various methods that uh, take quite some time to explain now. And there's different methods to think through what are the factors that will influence the answer to that question. We call these driving forces, the factors that will answer the question. And then we put these driving forces together in different ways to come up with two, three, four different stories of the future and how the future can be different. So it's not future with an E, but ES, futures. Thinking about different futures. And we'll come back to that. And I think that, um, again, this is uh, back to the futures cone that I showed you. Is it we think linearly in one way and we get shocked? Do we have a more rounded view of the cone of possibility? Okay, so um, I'm gonna pause here for a while to drink my tea and also to see if uh, we have any questions from the participants. Uh, it's a bit hard for me to see your image now, but uh, if there's a raise of hands or Sue, you can tell me. I'm gonna take Actually, a pause. Actually, there's, and there's questions in the chat box. Okay. About where me... can I find information on foresight in agro industry or agri business? Yeah, you didn't mm. have okay. So thank you. A practical question. I will share more information uh, later, but I think one source of it, for example, would be that um, the UN FAO, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, is also uh, using more foresight methods. In fact, the whole UN family is using more foresight methods to try to think about the future in a more uh, deep way and also to bring different stakeholders together in a conversation about where the future can be leading and should go. Um, and then um, I think the other body, um, ASEAN doesn't do it so much, but in our region, the ADB, Asian Development Bank, also uses foresight quite a lot, including uh, looking at uh, food-related uh, cases and, and, and funding. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, one last example to share is uh, OECD. The, uh, so I'll, I'll share together with uh, the, the deck of slides a few links, but the OECD sure. is like a think tank of wealthy countries. They also mm -hmm. use a lot of foresight um, uh, methods. Yep. And uh, later I'll be showing you one example of, of a scenario um, as well. Okay. You, yep. So let me just uh, move on now. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and I think uh, hopefully we leave time for many more questions. So now I'm going to talk about um, the food sector itself, you know, and here I'm not the expert. We are all professionals in different parts of the food sector. So let me just share with you some of my thoughts quickly and see if uh, it uh, can spark some good uh, good discussion. Okay, so um, I think you know the history of food. Uh, we used to be hunter-gatherers, and then we settled down in fertile river valleys, uh, and cities became the hubs of power and administration. And uh, we have uh, people, the peasants, in uh, the, the fields around there producing an agricultural surplus. Uh, and then that's how um, civilization developed more. You know, and in fact, I think since we did settle down in these communities, um, uh, there's been a recognition that food security is important for national security, certainly for regime security. Uh, one thing that the the 
uh, leaders of the world are supposed to deliver for their people is instability. And um, so this is uh, in the Asia, it's in the West as well. Of course, it's ex existential. We need food to survive. I talked about the food riots. I think these were a wake-up call uh, for many countries to pay more attention to food price stability, uh, to horizon scanning in food, uh, and to uh, address food insecurity, and at least to have more foresight over where food security matters are going. And I think there's a lot of challenges. Uh, you would know about the SDGs, uh, and um, you would know also about how uh, in many countries of ASEAN, we're agrarian, but there's still food deficit. Singapore, certainly 90% food deficit. And uh, food, uh, agri-food value chains form a big uh, aspect of GDP and of employment, even more so for employment, uh, because it's low, low value add. And some people say it's a sunset career, uh, youth in farming, uh, and maybe even in different parts of the food sector may not be so there. Um, we know about the uh, uh, ecological imprint uh, of the food sector. Uh, it's about 25% of uh, human-generated carbon emissions, but there's so much more than that, you know, uh, eutrophication, uh, uh, land degradation, deforestation, and so on, a big eco-footprint. Uh, and also with that, comes other issues like uh, AMR, antimicrobial resistance, uh, and uh, in the cities. So the history has been one of rural urban migration, and then people getting all the lifestyle diseases, malnutrition, undernutrition, micronutrient deficiency in the cities. Meanwhile, in the countryside, partly because of over-concentration uh, after the Green Revolution in a certain number of crops, monocropping, we've had a spike in disease, and uh, the climate change effects have also catalyzed that. Plant disease, animal disease, zoonosis. And I think that that alone can lead to a very big crisis. I think that fall armyworm uh, has hit Thailand. I believe African swine fever as well. Certainly it hit China very badly. And so uh, I mentioned this, you know, most people are saying with all these problems and with food sector itself being the problem, how do we feed people next time? So maybe let's just take it that we do need to feed 10 billion, although I don't think the population will increase to there. So that's one concern. And then food and politics. I hope I don't see anything sensitive, but certainly I think now more than ever or more than in many recent times, food security and food will become more politicized. Um, when 911 happened and then the US invasion of Iraq, uh, um, France refused to support the US in uh, the attack. Uh, and so the US rebranded French fries as freedom fries. And then closer to home, I think different people in Asia fight about which uh, whether this dish came from one country or another or both. Certainly that happens between Singapore and Malaysia and Indonesia, for instance. Um, okay, and then uh, quite uh, serious food politics, like when Qatar uh, some years ago had a disagreement with its neighbors and their supply chain got blocked a lot, but they had a lot of oil wealth. They could fly in thousands of cows to create a dairy industry, air condition uh, in the desert overnight. And that was another wake up call on the importance of uh, intentional provisions by policymakers, by corporates for food security. Certainly the Ukraine crisis as well. And uh, I think all this and COVID and so on has really led to some random uh, food supply chain um, disruptions. I'm not sure how much in Thailand you, you guys are fans of sriracha sauce, but apparently for a while there was a sriracha sauce crisis. I don't think this will be existential, but uh, it certainly uh, got a lot of sauce lovers um, challenged. Uh, and there's a lot of food fake news uh, as well. Um, when COVID started, there was a fake news that there will be a giant lasagna provided as food aid during lockdown time at Wembley Stadium in London. Uh, but that was uh, fake news. And certainly a lot of fake news about remedies, vaccines, uh, foods you can eat so you won't get COVID and so on. So a big spike in fake news and a crisis that again, you guys as nutritionists and food scientists who have to face of mistrust of authority or not knowing who to listen to on claims about uh, the 
medicinal, the health effects of various foods. And even more so because of all the tech disruption, right? Lab-grown meat. I don't know whether you know that uh, Winston Churchill, famous British leader who died a long time ago, predicted that uh, cultured meat will happen. And in fact, uh, places like Singapore, maybe Thailand, are now pioneering in trying to scale up and make affordable this new category of alternate protein. And certainly there's also a lot of plant-based meat. And there's a lot of policy innovation, as I mentioned, with more focus on food security. So my country, for instance, about uh, five years ago now, launched its 30 by 30 journey to say that by the end of this decade, in 2030, we want 30% of Singapore's nutritional needs to be met from local production. Uh, and this happened, unfortunately, before COVID, before the war. So in fact, I think our local production percentages have flatlined or even decreased a little bit here and there. So 30 by 30 is uh, now, I think, uh, trying to review and see what's next to still meet uh, this ambition. And in fact, I think this speaks to the wider challenge of whether cities can produce more of their own food. And if you think about it, if we manage to do this, this will be revolutionary. What if Bangkok could 80% feed itself without needing you know, so much uh, rice growing and so on in the province? That's something to put on a futures wheel that I showed you earlier. And if you think about it, the consequences of cities being able to feed themselves will be quite profound. And some will be good or bad, depending on who you are in this whole new value chain and what your interests are. So, but, um, and so we are trying. So there's a lot of investment going on, uh, aquaculture, aquaponics, indoor farming, fermentation, beyond just cultured meat. I think your own country, of course, has a long agrarian history and is one of the bread baskets of ASEAN in many ways, certainly in rice. So uh, I think there was a lot of focus on the BCG economy last year when uh, Thailand hosted the APEC. Um, and um, I think also um, uh, uh, one you are one benchmark that I find interesting when I look at how we are trying to get a circular economy uh, between the food vertical and other types of verticals. And also looking at uh, um, different byproducts of uh, food uh, of food processing, of uh, cultivation. Uh, certainly food waste to energy, food processing waste to energy, but uh, even other things that can be done like building materials and so on. So no, I haven't been stalking Thailand, but I did do some research on the sugarcane industry. And one thing that's interesting that I saw is that um, I'm just using Thailand as an example. I think of what's happening in Isan province based on what I've read. But I think that um, you see governments and corporates trying to look at the whole regional agri-food economy and how to transform the regional agri-food economy in certain provinces of countries to be more sustainable and to provide uh, more quality jobs for people so you can have sustainable development in place. So another example of this uh, and embracing sustainability is the palm oil sector that I think is a big near where I come from, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and trying to see whether you can get a whole uh, country's cultivation certified, you know, rather than just having industry specific or corporate syndicate specific certification like RSPO. Okay, so uh, this was me when I was last in Thailand. And uh, I don't want to comment on your politics, but uh, I know you have a new prime minister. But what was very interesting to me is when I was trying to give a talk at uh, BTEC in May at uh, ProPAC Asia, uh, some very senior guests came along. And uh, uh, one of the pictures there is uh, my, my friend uh, Santi Ab Abkas talking to them. You know, uh, uh, So our session got, got disrupted. So the point I'm trying to make is that food and politics have always had a relation. So I was speaking as a food scientist, uh, food, uh, excuse me, as a political scientist. But I think that with all the pressures facing the food system, again, challenge and opportunity, there'll be more politics uh, and more policy focus that will shape uh, the future of food. It won't just be left to industry. And so it will be 
big agri-food business and big government seeing whether they can make a deal or will they be fighting or will they reach a compromise? And then there's also civil society. So it'd be a very exciting time in the politics and the policy of food. Talking about my own country, I don't know whether you follow our news, but we have we had an exciting presidential campaign last week. And uh, I had the honor of meeting the guy who got voted to be Singapore's next president, uh, Mr. Tharman. And uh, so he's an Indian Singaporean. We're a multiracial country. But he himself also, you know, I think partly to show he connects with the majority of Singaporeans who are not Indian, you know, he talked about food. Um, I think many of uh, you in Thailand, especially those who have any background from Chao Chou, might know of uh, this dish. He talked about how he liked to eat this dish. Uh, it's called uh, Oni uh, in Singapore. I'm not sure what you call it in Thailand. If there's a Thai Same. name. Same. Similar. Okay. Yes, I love Oni. But uh, did you know, uh, Sue, that uh, supposedly, uh, called, uh, so again, is this food fake news? Uh, but in Thailand, do you guys believe that eating Oni helps you become more fertile? <laughs> no uh, idea. So anyway, this uh, while he was on the campaign, he and his wife, of course, you go to social media nowadays, and they were talking about how when they were trying to conceive, they ate Oni, and I think it, it worked. Yeah. So food and politics. And um, it's a big deal. And I think one of the main reasons it's a big deal is because a lot of people, middle class, poor people, are really trying to cope with rising prices throughout, especially in essentials like food. So these are the FAO statistics up to uh, recent times, the trend lines. I think sugar price has been spiking. Cereals supposedly have been going down. Uh, and this is based on the baseline year. But look at this. Can anyone tell me uh, what this is? Any guess? What this Stock is? Uh, this is a US dollar price chart for mm -hmm. an important commodity. I think, and it goes up to uh, one, two months ago, uh, the price in 2023. Okay, I purposely left out the label. This is Thai 5% broken rice price. That is, uh, I think, uh, a key in this for uh, rice prices around, around the region. So if I'm not wrong right now, uh, it's uh, actually breached the 600 US dollar per, per ton mark. Um, so much higher than it's been in recent years and maybe reaching multi-year and even a decade plus highs as well. And in fact, if you look at the food insecurity statistics, uh, it mirrors that story. Even before the Ukraine conflict and COVID, um, food insecurity was rising. Uh, these are FAO stats. And I think that it's partly because of the effects of climate change as they slowly creep up and don't just hit poor people, but hit you know normal people in uh, not so poor countries. Uh, and uh, also due to uh, displacement of people and food insecurity of displaced population. So um, this is the romantic view of uh, migration. I don't know whether they ate uh, Oni on board the Titanic, but uh, this is the sad reality of migration. And uh, you probably know there's a lot of fear that if there's extreme famine, food insecurity, in fact, there'll be more of this forced migration. And if uh, one or two countries around our region go down, other countries will also have to deal with this humanitarian crisis that will become a crisis also of uh, provision of food. And so, in fact, I think the food science solutions and food safety solutions for efficient humanitarian assistance and disaster relief will become more important. I think in Thailand, you may face some of this because of the troubles in one of your countries next door. I think in Bangladesh also, there are hundreds of thousands of refugees, for example. Now I want to show you this uh, chart that uh, I think is quite interesting. And so it shows the reducing share of labor in agri-food in different parts of the world. And on the one hand, is it a good or bad thing? You know, it, um, uh, some people could say that, oh, you know, um, agriculture, yes, as we have more mechanization, more automation. Let's let people go into more uh, higher value added jobs in other sectors. But I don't think it's such a good thing. As a futurist, my opinion is that 
it's a problematic thing because uh, you've probably used chat GPT. I don't know whether there's a Thai version, but there's a lot of concern about whether AI, artificial general intelligence, will end together with things like robotics, will over time uh, take more jobs away, you know? And so if these people uh, don't have jobs, what happens to them? Uh, of course, agriculture itself and a lot of farm to fork agri-food processes also can be automated and I'm not arguing against technology. But I do foresee a future where we might want to actually, by design, encourage and cater for more employment in sustainable agri-food and agroforestry, including to soak up technology-related unemployment from today's white-collar and blue-collar jobs. This is one theory I'm developing. And we talk about youth. Uh, there's this lie flat phenomena uh, among the youth, losing hope, having a good degree, but what can you do with it? And so to turn the image around, we want people not to lie flat, but to reconnect with the soil and to work in harmony with nature and understand, relearn, learn, relearn nature's rhythms. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these slides just to um, uh, uh, um, note some other challenges. I think we talked about NCD. Uh, foodborne illness is uh, and uh, worsened by AMR is very important. Um, okay, this talks about uh, some on the policy side of the agenda. This is a FAO slide from about a year ago talking about moving beyond the immediate crisis. What are some priorities for agri-food policy? and the industry over the medium and long term, increasing science and innovation, uh, reducing food loss and waste, which I think alone, if we can even half food loss and waste, really will uh, keep hunger. Uh, rice and grain loss and waste uh, is a major issue. As you know, in emerging markets, more uh, issue about loss due to heat, due to poor supply chains and storage, uh, and in the developed markets, a lot of waste. Um, I personally think that we should put more restrictions on buffets in fancy hotels because there's a lot of uh, food wastage and then also things that can be done over the longer term. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, try to talk for five more minutes to leave more time for questions and I see some questions coming up. So I think one thing we need to do as food professionals is to think spatially. So previously, if you live in Bangkok or Singapore and you're not poor, you can really think about getting food from everywhere, you know? But then the recent troubles made that into a problem, a challenge, especially with the COVID lockdown. So I want to challenge you to think at each layer from where you are now uh, to the world, what are the food production upside potential using technology and innovation but also other types of innovation, social innovation, community partnerships, and so on. So firstly, at the household level, what, including with new solutions, can households produce more of in a full circular, full value chain way? Could it be algae fermentation? Not just about having a garden in your backyard or your porch. And similarly, similarly at neighborhood level, in Singapore, there are a lot of community gardens that are becoming more and more edible community farms. But again, new technology potential. Then there's the urban and peri-urban, the grey triangle. And then what uh, different countries with more land than Singapore can produce, the green circle. The most exciting area to me, uh, and again, this is where politics comes in, is the purple star. This is not the world, but a subset of the world. You've probably heard of friendshoring saying that in a troubled world, we want value chains and trade flows to be with our friends, especially for critical survival things like weapons, maybe like food or semiconductors, which is happening right now. So who will your friends be? And is there potential to have more of a sustainable and efficient food value chain with them? This will be one of the themes that will shape the future of food. So I'm going to fast forward over this, but uh, this is looking from inside out uh, to the world in terms of different innovations and trends I see here. 
uh, exploiting different aspects of space in, under, and above the city. Circularity between the food sector and the built environment, building materials, uh, as well as energy. Thoughts about the shape of the future smart city. So um, there are a lot of building blocks, and this could be a discussion in itself. But one thing that I wanted to highlight here would be personalized nutrition. Moving ahead next time, I think the science of thinking about all the omics of uh, what individuals will have in terms of the relation between what they eat and the health outcomes, the wellness outcomes, the scientific knowledge will advance. And on the food science, food service, food manufacturing side, the ability to produce bespoke solutions that taste right, but are also right in terms of health, performance, mental health, uh, and so on for individuals will be very powerful. So knowledge plus solutioning. And so for individuals next time, life can be great in terms of your food lifestyle that integrates both wellness as well as taste. But do we want this just to be for rich people? I don't think so. As a matter of public policy, I think that we want to scale this up so that everyone in society can enjoy more personalized nutrition, personalized wellness, and in fact, personalized health care as well. So, and if you think about it, if we can do that at a system level, in terms of the food flows, that also can help us optimize the allocation of limited food resources, as, which is even more important in a time of environmental constraints on production. So this elaborates on that. And, um, and so, but what's the missing piece in all this? Um, these are all maybe useful ideas, I hope. But the most important thing is that consumers, you need to bring them along with you. There'll be a lot of importance in terms of consumer education and the science or the art of persuading people to shift their food lifestyles, their food values, their food habits. This will be one defining challenge. Um, I took part in a Deliveroo Foresight project trying to gaze at some of these trends. And so just, here is just some images of that future of personalized nutrition. And also another aspect of that is a metaverse dining, where experientially you can dine just like we're having a Zoom call right now, but with everyone really feeling very present, very Star Wars as well. And that is also another magnifier, multiplier of your dining experience. So in fact, you know, maybe one challenge that you, you guys can work on in your careers will be to reach that nirvana of food. Can we reach a stage where whatever we eat can be fully tasty and also fully good for us at the same time? In other words, the eating experience and the health and wellness impact are independent variables next time. Let's see if we can get there. These are just different visuals from a, a food city perspective of different ways in which we are trying to reshape the urban landscape uh, in, to have more edible features and also more sustainable features in terms of air quality as well and making food and energy from the sea. Okay, I think that I'm just going to fast forward right to the end. I just have a few more slides so we have more time for discussion. So now it's basically talking uh, at a bigger and bigger scale in the map. I just want to have a quick word on ASEAN. I talked about how we should at least look at how there may be more French shoring in future. In fact, hopefully uh, as ASEAN, we can be more uh, closer friends as well. If you look at the EU right now, two thirds of the food trade by value is within the region. But for ASEAN, it's only about one third right now. I'm not saying this in a protectionist way. I'm not saying we should have barriers to food trade with other parts of the world. But I think that there's a lot of unrealized potential for agri-food sector development in different ASEAN countries and growing the value chain, growing trade, investment, and IP flows across ASEAN. Why is this important? So that if other parts of the world go into climate failure modes or have conflicts, then we can stand up our own food system and be more 
accountable for and be more resilient in our own food security. And oh, East Timor is a new member of, uh, that may be coming into ASEAN. And so there's a lot of this um, French shoring and more different countries seeing new angles to collaborate. And um, okay, so just a few last words on some interesting developments. I think aquaculture, uh, no joke, but with rising sea levels, we will need to live, work, play, and make food in, under, and on the sea more. So China, for instance, has a uh, launching many big fleets of aquaculture ships and um, making food, sourcing food from the deep sea. This is, I think, a Taiwan uh, uh, picture. And okay, let's not talk so much about the South China Sea, but the point I'm trying to make here is that if different countries can do a deal and stop fighting over the sea, imagine how it can be a great source of sustainable aquaculture production not to mention energy production and a place to live, work, play. Okay, so um, one more thing I wanted to highlight, and I think Thailand has a lot of this, is neglected, underutilized species of food. And back to how we need more biodiversity in our food system. Uh, and in fact, the current food price inflation, rice crisis and all this should make us think and you guys as nutritionists as well. What are alternate paths to nutrition? Okay, I wanted to share with you this scenario on the future of Southeast Asian food security. But I think in the interest of time, I will give this to you in the reference slide. Eventually, I may be doing a write-up uh, on it. But uh, so I think we are right at the top of the hour. I'm not sure how whether we have five minutes to take questions, but I'm going to look now at... Uh, my uh the questions here and i have a conclusion slide as well that will wrap up in a minute sure i believe you can have about five minutes of discussions at this point okay. and there's a couple of questions in the chat box um i think one question is about in terms of uh, cost efficiency what crops require less water and energy to grow and or produce less pollutions mm. i think you already mentioned that in your talk about algae right that, yeah. that might be the, the way to go for that. Mm. And as you mentioned about climate change related crisis, for example, drought, floods, which limited areas to grow crops and further threaten the world, food securities. So what are you planning or doing now to take to tackle these inevitable issues? Mm. Okay. Yeah. And then I see the last question from Postat. Thank you. Yeah. Um, right. It's for uh, site. As, uh, does it reach a level of a scientific reference here? Okay, so let me try to answer these questions together. Um, I think, okay, I'm not an agronomist, but in terms of my general reading and research, I think in terms of cost efficiency and also resource efficiency, water, energy, um, and so on. I think that, let me look at grains, for instance. Alternate carbs, I think, will become very important as there is, uh, uh, assuming there's more and more climate stress, and we are in El Nino and so on. So just some examples of uh, superfoods that uh, I've read about and that people are trying to get more interest in. It will be sorghum, millet, and also a non-grain cassava, tubers, you know. So uh, all these have uh, a lot of energy content. Some of them, the GI level may be advantageous. And in different ways, some of these are more drought resistant uh, and also uh, perhaps pest resistant. And I think that here's where um, it's a whole topic in itself, but I think GM gene editing or just non-transgenic uh, uh, means of uh, looking at uh, new crop varieties as well as old crop varieties will become quite important. And I think that uh, to go into the next question, I think that's why uh, one big category of urban farming that's being developed now uh, to protect against pollutants and to look at um, uh, being more frugal in use of resources is controlled environment agriculture, either in a greenhouse or rooftop or uh, flatted indoor farming as well. So uh, one of the key benefits of more controlled environment farming is that you can limit certain pests and diseases, although some forms of greenhouse farming also have some of these issues like diamondback moth, for instance. 
you know, but one of the key weaknesses of, of indoor farming is precisely that uh, there's a energy, uh, is energy intensive in a way that is costly, especially if energy prices going up since the Ukraine war, but it's also not so sustainable, right? So that's why agrivoltaics is coming in. And I think that our food security uh, challenge will really be solved with a big assist from sustainable energy uh, solution development, be it in solar getting better and better, geothermal, which even tiny Singapore is exploring, you know, all things like um, nuclear and fusion power, if we can, uh, and uh, wind power and so on. So if sustainable energy really takes off sustainably, then that will be a big help for, for food security. I think lastly, when we talk about um, foresight research, so um, I just talked briefly about some methods and uh, like scenarios, for example, you know, so all these uh, visions and claims about where the future can be, some of these are very linked to science and technology in a way, like looking at the tech stack and where you foresee the technology readiness level of certain solutions or categories of technologies can go, you know, and it's very informed by expert consultation, Delphi and so on, you know. So I think that when we look at future scenarios, um, I think that the logic of why we get into those scenarios and the interaction of various factors, economic, uh, political, uh, technological, and so on, is important in the narrative and the, lo uh, the, the logic of the scenario. But ultimately, these are visions. And I think that we need to have the discussion of which uh, how do we succeed in all these futures? And then that will determine our actual plan of what we do. And then we have to see if we are building towards that future or to do the best in the future that does, does happen. So foresight research is not conclusive, but it points out possibilities that then we realize through our plans and actions. All right. Thank you so much, Luke. Mm. I believe um, there's one more. Questions in the chat box. Okay. Uh, as a slide on zero A about the uh, ESG, carbon credits and carbon footprints, a new topic that is not enforcement yet in Thailand, just by volunteer. In terms of your foresight, will this issue become the international requirement for trades in the near future? Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you about that uh, question. So in fact, yes, again, I'm sorry. I think I had too many slides, Sue. So I apologize. You know, so um, I think I'll just talk quickly about this. So um, this slide you see, 1 to 15, to me. Uh, okay, so this is where I've got the focal question. What will the future of Southeast Asian food security look like, um, I would say, over the next 20 years or so? And then this 1 to 15, especially 1 to 5, is my own answer to that question. Um, this was one version of something that is coming out in a book chapter soon that I, I, I'll share the reference with you once available. So basically, my top five uh, important factors that are uncertainties are climate, tech, um, uh, the political economic space built together, um, and then also do consumers, the society feel engaged or disengaged with all this new stuff, you know, and then also what is the policy uh, framework in different countries or across the region. So to cut to the chase, I think that, um, so again, this is where scenarios are visions of the future. And it may not, scenario A may not happen. It might be scenario B or scenario C or none of these, you know, but it's to stretch our thinking on what can happen. So I think that right now, whether there'll be um, uh, robust carbon markets, carbon taxes, carbon credits, and so on. I think that this is the way that policy elites and corporate elites are trying to achieve green growth. So the problem right now is, can you measure the carbon positive negative effect of certain things in food and also in other categories? The, the protocols for measuring this are still being worked out and the carbon markets are still nascent, you know. So it might be a case where around the world, um, the EU, for instance, is the big environmental regulation power and is coming up with a lot of new policies and approaches. So will these scale and get adopted in other places? So part of this will be uh, will happen or more likely to happen 
if there is more international cooperation. So for instance, can the US, China, EU, and ASEAN agree on a common global protocol for carbon trading, carbon standards, including Thailand? So I think that you need to have that policy scale and alignment for it to happen in individual countries in a big way. Otherwise, it might be just country-level experiments. All right. Thank you so much, Luke. I believe we have learned a lot about the foresight and, and how we can adopt um, the concept of foresight in terms of like to the like small level, maybe like writing a proposal for a grant, maybe thinking about the potential scenarios and preparing the research work to back up. So preparing for uncertainty for sure. And I think this is just a sneak peek into the tools that you have and projections of the foresight in the food industry. So with that, I thank you for sharing your experience and also expertise with us. Okay. And share thank the worldview of food, like future food industry as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sue. If you just allow me 30 seconds, I've got sure. a conclusion slide on some takeaways. So yes. yeah, I've been thinking what can be practical, you know. So I think that um for emerging professionals in food science and nutrition, I think so you guys are probably good at your job. You know, you've got a lot of knowledge, but that's a KAQ model, you know. So moving forward, what other knowledge do you want to accumulate? You know, but A and Q are important also. What abilities do you want to have? What qualities, what qualities of leadership, uh, what, what uh, values do you, do you need to have moving forward? So I hope I've covered the value of foresight, a little taste of it. And I think, Sue, you helped to contextualize one way that it can be used. I think that one basic value that's very important is horizon scanning so that you can see the next big thing and uh, capitalize on the opportunity. Start that startup, for instance. So one best one of the best ways to see change is to be the change yourself in the new innovation, the new product. You know. So lastly, I think that, you know, hopefully, thank you for inviting me as someone from not from your country to share. So I think this is an example of how we really should go beyond our silos to build our regional and international networks. I, and I think that's that's the way to go, especially in the region in, in ASEAN to build our food value chain. And lastly, I'm just saying this as an analyst, I think that like it or not, at least for the next few years, politics and food security will, will really lead over economics in terms of how um, the food sector moves forward. And so how do we uh, leave room also in all that for sustainability and align innovation? I think that to me, I'll capture that as, as the challenge for us as we move forward in our professional careers. So thank you so much again and uh, pleasure to be with you all and share some thoughts. Hopefully it's useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.